We're at Joe Wanamaker's Tulsa Gun Show, the world's largest gun show. Only about, I think, 17,000 or so of these are made. There are not a lot of them out there. The Werder is, is literally an asterisk to a footnote in history. Do those values surprise you on these? Somewhat. Well, a lot of people at home have got to be wondering what exactly is a shoots and rifle. The Sharps begin life as a percussion Civil War era carbine. I think they're darn nice Christmas yeah, presents. Yeah, it's like he had a better Christmas. Than yeah. <laughs> Guns have shaped our history for hundreds of years. We're telling the stories of Americans. Each firearm has a unique tale to tell. This is a gun that won World War II. Oh, man. Join evaluators Jim Sapika and Phil Schreier as they experience the disappointment. Rarity doesn't always mean valuable. And the excitement. Unbelievable. As everyday gun owners discover the true value of their prized possessions on MRA's Guns and Gold. We're at Joe Wanamaker's Tulsa Gun Show, the world's largest gun show. Brian, uh, well, where are you from to start with? I'm from Petersburg, Texas. Petersburg, well, very yes, cool. You've brought a, a Marlin Ballard uh, number six yes, shoots and rifle. We don't see many of these wandering around. Tell me a little bit about what you know about it already. Gun I picked up from a gentleman in Texas. Uh, he really didn't. Uh, know that much about it, but he had a book put together that showed me a lot of interesting facts about the gun. The gun itself was used uh, in the 1880s and earlier for uh, target shooting, and uh, they had a lot of clubs up in the uh, northern tier states, and uh, the biggest one, I guess, was in New York, and they fired or would shoot for a prize of about $25,000 in gold, so it was worth a lot of money for them back then. Well, a lot of people at home have got to be wondering what exactly is a shoots and rifle. Uh, this is really the type of gun that made the NRA uh, in its early days. Basically, a, a German immigrant coming over to the United States beginning in the 1840s uh, brought with them a love for firearms, as, they, as they've always had. And shoots and fests, or shooting festivals, coincided with the Oktoberfest at the end of the, the planning year. And they set out to, uh, to have contests, really unique hand-painted targets. And the idea was to who, who could be the, the most accurate at the longest distance. Most of them were uh, done offhand, which means standing. So here we have uh, a special uh, hook in the, uh, in the stock that, that fits right under your shoulder to uh, help keep the gun balanced as you apply upward pressure to it. And that happens by uh, putting this in the palm of your hand and resting it like that. It's got beautiful target sights on it. As you can see, the front sight's protected uh, with the hood. It's got a uh, falling block action. What caliber is this, do you know? This one's a 4070 Ballard. Uh, Henry Pope was famous for uh, taking these barrels and accurizing them. Uh, one of the first custom accurizers uh, Henry Pope barrels are still highly sought after today. Most of the ones I've seen have always been uh, engraved. A lot of yes, the receivers sir. are nickeled. This is kind of a plain, a plain Jane uh, model here. The number six was an expensive gun, uh, even back there in the internet time. And what they would do is usually the guys who could afford the uh, expensive guns, they also could afford to have them nickeled, also to have them engraved. So it's sometimes it's, it's very rare to find one that has not had uh, engraving on it. Right. The finish on this, do you know if the gun was cold blued or refinished at any you time? I do not have a clue. I, I don't know. It was sold as original as the guy had gotten it sold. And uh, what, uh, what do you value the gun at? I've had it for about five years. Uh, I'm guessing it's probably around 5,000 to 6,500 value. I, uh, I think you're right in the, in the area there. The, some of the books put it between 3,500 and 7,500, depending on condition. I'd want a real expert to tell me whether this receiver's been touched up at all. The, the, the lettering on the uh, J.M. Marlin uh, Ballard's patent line looks a little thin to me. We have one apology here in the wood, uh, the, the, the crack there. Uh, beautiful forend. 
you're starting to lose just a little bit of the uh, of the plating from wear, but that's honest use and wear. That's right. not you're gonna lose a lot of points on that. I do see some of what looks like active uh, corrosion or rust here on the site, and you wanna you wanna touch that up, uh, not with bluing or anything, right. but just clean it. Uh, get some oil and, and and clean that to keep it from getting any any worse. I, I'd put the gun probably right in the. Uh, Right in the middle of that ballpark figure, maybe four to, to six, somewhere in that area. Thanks a lot for bringing this out and sharing it with us on NRA's Guns and Gold. NRA's Guns and Gold, presented by Brownells, is brought to you by Brownells, the world's largest supplier of firearms, accessories, and gunsmithing tools. LifeLock, relentlessly protecting your identity and a proud sponsor of the NRA. Blue Book Publications Incorporated. Why guess when you can be sure? Wanamaker's Tulsa Arms Show. Check out the world's largest gun and knife show at TulsaArmsShow.com, NRAStore.com. For thousands of NRA logo apparel and unique accessory items, visit NRAStore.com. We've got Grant and Chance with us here. Guys, thanks for coming in. Yes, sir. And you brought in a pair of rifles. Uh, you guys are cousins? Yes, Correct. sir. And you got this from these both from the same guy, right? Who'd you get these from? Our grandpa. Your grandpa. Yes. Great. Sir. Great. And how'd you come by them? Well, uh, last Christmas, grandpa put each gun in a case and put a number on every case, and then we all drew numbers out of a hat. You got cool. which gun you got the number cool. on. Cool. So. Cool. Very cool. Who got the sharps and who got the rook rifle? I got the sharps. You got the rook rifle? Yep. You guys happy with what you got? Oh, yeah. I, li I like your grandpa. I want that type of grandpa yeah, for he's Christmas, all right. I'll tell you. Yeah. I'll yeah. tell you that. That's very, very cool. Well, let's start with the rook rifle. Rook is a, a British word for a crow type of bird. Basically, that's what it is. It's a, a gun, kind of a garden gun for pests in the garden. Okay. Uh, took a low, uh, relatively low powered uh, uh, cartridge. This looks to be about a 30 caliber. Uh, but they were usually a little rim fire caliber. Now, the rook guns I'm used to seeing and dealing with generally don't have a whole lot of value. I see a lot of uh, rook guns that are kind of well worn and kind of shoddily made. They're, you yeah. know, $100, $200 guns. This is a much nicer gun than okay. your usual Good. rook gun. It's very Good. well made, it's Belgian made, it's in nice condition. It's got the uh, thumb brake open, you can see there, uh, and that's a standard type of brake open action. Yeah. The little rook rifle has a nice extractor on it, uh, beautifully checkered, nice wood, in very nice condition, and much better than the uh, average rook rifle that okay. you see. So it's a Good. nice, uh, it is a nice gun. The Sharps, model 1863, began life as a percussion Civil War era carbine. So this oh, wow. was probably used in the Civil War, wow. uh, and it is a breech loader, which was uh, uh, innovation at the time of the Civil War. You drop the uh, breech block and you would load from here. Yeah. And when it was a percussion gun, you'd load a paper cartridge. This one has been converted, probably by the military, to take a metallic cartridge. So it uh, uh, probably saw Civil War use and then probably was converted and possibly used by the military after the Civil War. Very historic gun. Of course, it's got the slide bar saddle ring loop on it. Uh, but you see a lot of the nice coloring on it. Overall, this gun is in better condition. This gun is older, and for the age, this is very, very nice condition on this gun. Now as to values, what do you guys think they're worth? We've been asking around, and we've heard about 1,000 on this one and 3,000 on that. Well, I'm going to go with the under on You're going to hurt us, all right. Yeah, I'm all right. afraid I am. Okay. I think the little rook gun, uh, my opinion only, I think that's a, a $400 to $700 gun. Okay. Very nice little gun. The Sharps, uh, I think it I think it breaks 2000 and keeps going. I don't know if it gets to 3000 or not, okay. but I would say in the 2000 to $2,500 range, but uh, still nice. I think they're darn nice Christmas yeah, presents. Yeah, yeah. Looks like he had a better Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> All right. The other members of the family get guns they too. They did. There was a Winchester uh, Model 1892 given away Whoa. too. Whoa! Tell you what, invite me over for next yeah. Christmas, okay? I want to get in. <laughs> I on think this. he's wiped out. Oh darn! Right. Well, thank you guys. Right. I appreciate you bringing them in. Thank you. Thank you. We have a real special relationship with our grandpa. We go on trips with him every year, and he's uh, he's a big historian. He likes old guns. He likes to collect. So uh, for him to pass some of that down to us is, is really special. My 
grandfather and my dad both are avid collectors of guns and just I've been going to gun shows since I was probably five years old. I know what to look for. I know what's valuable. I know what's not valuable now. And I think guns are going to do nothing but go up in value. And I think their teachings to me have uh, actually benefited me in that aspect. Tom, where are you from? From Wichita. From Wichita, and you brought a very interesting Bavarian rifle uh, by Werder. Uh, really interesting uh, stuff about it. Tell me about where did how did you come by? Well, I got two bad habits: cars, guns, and I did, did some work for a friend of mine on his uh, old Triumph car, and he gave me this as, as a reward. Yeah, the Werder is, is an interesting. Um, literally an asterisk to a footnote in history. We rewind the, uh, the timeline back to the 1860s. Bavaria was one of 26 different kingdoms and principalities that uh, were considered part of, of Germanic Federation. So greater Germany as we know it didn't come around until 1871. This gun predates that. This is the 1867-1869 Werder rifle. The uh, military version of this was adopted by the Bavarian military and also used by the Austrians to some extent. Interesting action. It's a single shot cartridge uh, gun. This is the hammer. You draw this back. When you pull the trigger, uh, the hammer comes back, fires the gun. We've looked at uh, falling blocks and rolling blocks. This one, you just press this double trigger. You see the double trigger here is pretty neat situation. You just press that down and that action literally flies down there. Gave it the nickname the lightning uh, right. because of that. Out ejects the uh, spent shell. You drop in a new one by drawing uh, back and cocking it. You cock the gun and close the breech and, and it's ready to, to fire once more. This is a, a, obviously a, a civilian sporting uh, model of the uh, same period. Nice sights. Uh, this uh, uh, peep sight in the back. I know it was a gift, but what do you think it's it's worth to you? I'm, I'm guessing probably in the thousand dollar range. You know, I've never uh, seen one for sale. I know that there's the military version. There's also a, a, a pistol version, uh, and I have seen those. This is the first uh, sporting version of this I, I've seen. I, I tend to agree with you what little I know uh, about the market on these, I think that that's probably a real good, uh, real comfortable number to be at. Thanks a lot, Tom, for, for bringing My this pleasure. out. Thank you for the information. You know, depending on where you live, you might refer to the uh, war that took place between 1861 and 1865 as the American Civil War, the war between the states, my household, it was called the Late Unpleasantness by my grandmother. If it was up to one man named John Brown, those dates would have been pushed ahead two years earlier. So in October of 1859, he raided Harper's Ferry. John Brown attacked, attacked with a vengeance. His men were armed with 1853 pattern, slant breech, sharp carvings, just like this model right here. It's a, a brass furniture. Uh, sharps and 52 caliber. It has a uh, very large saddle ring carbine scabbard bar to it and uh, it's called the slant breech because you can see the the breech on this sharps is uh, not perpendicular to the, uh, the barrel like on subsequent models. And what made a sharp special was it wasn't a repeater but it was a breech loader. You could just drop the, uh, the breech here with the trigger guard and you can load the, uh, load the carving uh, with the round, place in a uh, percussion cap, and you have a breech loading carving. You can load and fire this much faster than a normal muzzle loader. The rebellion was short lived. It was put down by then Colonel Robert E. Lee and James Yule Brown Stewart, later to be known as Jeb Stewart, of Confederate cavalry fame. A number of the guns were, uh, were captured at Harper's Ferry, and a number of the, uh, the serial number blocks 
of the guns that were sold to uh, Brown uh, are known today. This gun falls within the range of those serial numbers that we know used by John Brown, which helps it identify during a very interesting time and period of American history. NRA's Guns and Gold, presented by Brownells, is brought to you by Brownells, the world's largest supplier of firearms, accessories, and gunsmithing tools. LifeLock, relentlessly protecting your identity and a proud sponsor of the NRA. Blue Book Publications Incorporated, why guess when you can be sure? Wanamaker's Tulsa Arms Show. Check out the world's largest gun and knife show at TulsaArmsShow.com, NRAStore.com. For thousands of NRA logo apparel and unique accessory items, visit NRAStore.com. We're here at the Tulsa Arms Show, and KG, you brought in a group of beautiful brass frame Winchesters. Tell me a little bit about where these came from. They're a lifetime collection. You brought them here for the gentleman. He wanted to learn a little bit more about them and, and uh, think about what he might do with them at some point in time. True. What you have here is you have uh, uh, some of the most popular guns for collectors, some of the most historic guns, guns with a real strong connection with the American West. These are the brass frame Winchesters, and you start with the Henry here, which is the uh, lever action uh, rifle. Uh, these were actually produced uh, during the Civil War from 1860, uh, clear up past the Civil War to 1866. Only about, I think, 17,000 or so of these are made. There are not a lot of them out there. But as kind of the first Winchester rifle, so to speak, with the, the Henry design improvements from the Volcanic, a uh, very, very significant gun. It's chambered for the 44 rim fire. This one is beautifully engraved, has a lot of original finish on it. 1866, Winchester stopped this model and introduced a, a new model. The uh, Model 1866, and you can see some of the obvious differences here. The 1866 models have the wood forend, whereas the Henry has no wood forend, and uh, they also have the loading gate on the side of the frame to load the cartridges through, whereas the Henry does not. Now these are also chambered for the 44 rimfire cartridge. This model, the 1866, was produced almost up to the turn of the century. They were discontinued in 1898 with a little over 170,000 made. They're called the Yellow Boy because of the yellow brass frame. Uh, very valuable and very sought after by collectors. This is a third model 1866 rifle. This is a third model 1866 musket, and it has a little bit longer barrel and also the longer wood on it, the longer forend is indicative of the musket with the uh, barrel bands on it. And this is a late production fourth model rifle. Now, have you done any, any checking in on the value of these? Uh, not really. I guess the bad news is I'm told that the market in brass frame for Henry's is down a little bit. They may not be quite as popular as they were a few years ago. The good news is I think you've got some very good, very desirable guns here that are going to bring uh, uh, good money. Certainly a good venue for these would be in a specialty gun auction. Now if you go that route, I think the, uh, this is the fourth model rifle, I think this is probably going to bring 10 to 20,000 at auction. Very nice gun, it's been cleaned a little bit, but it appears to be a good honest gun. Uh, just nice, uh, well used honest condition. You can see that it's the round barrel as opposed to the octagon barrel on some of the others. The musket is a rarer model. They made many fewer muskets than they did rifles and carbines, but they don't seem to have quite the same collector interest. So on this gun, I think you're going to be uh, about in that same value range, right in that uh, ten to twenty thousand dollar value range on the musket. Now we got something a little special going on this rifle here, and that is the engraving. This is very beautiful engraving. Uh, I would suggest that you have this rifle looked at by an expert, but to me this looks like absolutely straight uh, factory engraving, probably certainly period engraving. Uh, beautifully done. It does show a little bit of, of wear, but overall it's a very nice condition gun. And uh, I think with uh, with the engraving on this, the great overall appearance, I think you're going to probably better uh, better than double those values. I think you're probably getting in the twenty-five to thirty-five, forty thousand dollar range with this particular gun.
this Henry, in addition to being a very desirable model, has a couple of really great things going for it. First, and vitally important with any antique gun, especially one of this age, is the original condition. Now you look at this barrel, usually on a Henry, the barrel has gone brown with age, or worse yet, somebody has cleaned it, or worse still, they've tried to refinish it. Those will kill the value on a gun. To me, this looks to be the original bright blue and a whole lot of it left. Also, on the brass frame, you see quite a bit of silver finish remaining, even more on this side. And you can see the silver there, it's been lightly cleaned, but it's tarnished in protected areas. The light cleaning on that doesn't bother me. A heavy cleaning of that silver would be a, a bad idea. So that's just about perfect condition as it is. I would call this certainly a uh, high find, the excellent condition gun. And the other thing you have going is this beautiful period engraving. It's the scroll engraving on this side, uh, beautifully executed, certainly uh, proper for Winchester factory engraving. And the other side includes a scene of a dog. And again, you can see the beautiful silver finish remaining, but the dog panel scene with the, uh, with the scroll engraving. That also bumps the gun up considerably in interest and value. Now this gun particularly, I would suggest having inspected by an expert in Winchester engraving to confirm the, uh, the era of the engraving, confirm that it's original, and also see if you can identify the engraver. But to me, it looks absolutely straight, absolutely honest. And this gun, I think you're looking more in the $75 to $100,000 range. And at a, a competitive auction, it certainly has the potential to go up from there. They're, uh, they're a beautiful group of guns. I appreciate you bringing them in, very historic guns. Do those values surprise you on these? Somewhat. Well, I wish your friend the best of luck with these, and I appreciate getting to take a look at them. Thank you. Thank you.